Christians, the God you worship is an evil pit demon from hell, and I'm going to use your own book to prove it. Today, I'm breaking down my top 10 reasons why the God of the Bible actually more resembles a pit demon from hell than a benevolent father figure. From blood sacrifices and godly smiting in the Old Testament to eternal torment and fire in the New, does this sound like a God of love to you? Number 10, the fall of a woman. In the early chapters of Genesis, God creates man and woman, then allows the serpent to trick Eve into eating the forbidden fruit. As a result, all women are condemned to painful childbirth, and the desire they have for their husband is laid on them as a punishment. Genesis 3.16 Eve was not present when God told Adam not to eat the fruit, but Adam was present when Eve was deceived, and he apparently did nothing to intervene. Not only did he let her eat the fruit, but he also joined in her sin. Then, when God confronted him, Adam shifted the blame to Eve, saying, Genesis 3.12 the woman you gave to me, she gave me the fruit of the tree, and I ate it. Eve, the most innocent character in the Bible, is deceived by the serpent, betrayed by Adam, and smited by God, all in quick succession. She faced the harshest punishment in all of the Bible, next to burning in hell, of course, for not being able to outwit the serpent. Fatherly? Forgiving? Number 9. A Godly MMA-style Deathmatch after God tricks the first humans into sin, we see the first murder in the Bible. Cain kills his brother, Abel, out of jealousy. Cain and Abel both offer their best to God, but God favors Abel's offerings. This angers Cain, and God warns him, saying, Genesis 4, 7, If you do what is right, will you not be rewarded? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. Despite this warning, and literally being raised in the presence of God, Cain murders Abel. For the love of who? This pit demon. Then, as punishment, God tells him he will no longer have to farm, which is a crap job anyway since God made working the ground hard in his curse on Adam. And then Cain is marked for protection and allowed to live a long life, build a city, and father nations. All the best blessings God would visit on anyone in the Old Testament. Those were his punishments for murdering his own brother. Meanwhile, Eve, who was deceived by the serpent in her sin, faced severe punishment, pain in childbirth, and subservience to her husband's. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. Genesis 3.16 Number 8. Genocide and Cursing Children Another goodie is the story of Noah, where this pit demon describes humans as wicked from childhood, kills all mankind, then his favored human curses an innocent child and his entire lineage to slavery for the actions of its father. Genesis 9, 24 and 25. When Noah awoke from his wine and found out what his youngest son Ham had done to him, he said, Cursed be Canaan, Ham's son, the lowest of slaves, will he be to his brothers? Of course, God didn't curse Canaan. His favorite human, Noah, cursed the child, but it was God's power that backed up the curse. Number seven, crotch cooties for a king. Then we move on to Abram and Sarai, where the hero of the story whores out his incestuous sister wife to the Pharaoh for coin, cattle, and slaves, and ends up giving the Pharaoh an STD. Genesis 12, 17, but the Lord inflicted serious diseases on Pharaoh and his household because of Abram's wife, Sarai. But wait, she wasn't his sister. Oh yeah, she was. Genesis 20.12 Besides, she really is my sister, the daughter of my father, though not of my mother, and she became my wife. But when you read the scripture, you learn that she was also his niece. The God who wrote this book really seems to have a perversion for familial incest. A pit what? Lucky lot. Now we get to Lot, Abram's nephew and fellow hero of the Bible, considered holy enough by God to send two messengers to save him from the destruction of Sodom. This holy man tried to throw his virgin daughters out to be raped by a horny horde of homosexual Hebrews who were wanting to sex up the messengers. Then he gets drunk and has sex with his own two daughters and has children by them, men children, who go on to father nations, all once again blessings of this god monster. But who's the villain in the story of Lot? Lot's wife, whose mortal sin was that she looked back against God's wishes. Forgiving? Loving? Perverted? Wicked? What kind of God monster is this? Number six, a Job well done. Then there's the story of Job. Most people think of this as the one instance in the Bible where Satan kills someone, but that may be wrong. God says, go harm them. But the next chapter, and this is the word of God here, he says, though you moved me, to destroy them. So he takes credit for it. 
Job 2, 3. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. And he still maintains his integrity, though you incited me against him to ruin him without reason. Here, God destroys Job's life, kills his wife and children, takes his wealth, and gives him a disease just to test his faith. For what? A sick wager? This isn't love. This is sadistic. Imagine a pit demon watching Job's pain and suffering as some form of twisted entertainment, and it makes a lot more sense. Pain and suffering, by the way, endured in the name of loyalty to this very creature. Sure, Job got a new wife and children, which was, I'm sure, a soft comfort to the ones who were slaughtered for this God's bet. But this is a horrific example of a loving God. However, it's a prime example of a pit demon trying to pass itself off as a loving God. A God who allows suffering for sport. Does that sound divine or depraved? We're halfway through, so don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Number five, human scented flesh candles. And now let's talk about Jephthah's daughter from Judges 11. The Israelites were being oppressed by the Ammonites, and Jephthah agreed to defeat them on the condition that if he won, he gets to be the new leader of the Israelites. In desperation to win, in a selfish power grab, this hero of the Bible makes a vow to the God of the book to sacrifice in fire the first person who comes out to greet him when he gets home. I read that to say that the person who loves him the dearest and is the most eager to greet him when he returns after being gone so long is the one he's going to offer up to God as a burnt sacrifice. That person ends up being his daughter. Here's the God monster part. First, this creature allows Jephthah to win his battle and survive. If the cause was good but his promise bad, God could have given his people the battle but let him die to protect his innocent daughter. Yet God lets him win the battle and then does nothing to stop the sacrifice. The girl, sadly, is sacrificed, burned alive because her father made a deal with the devil with God. Think about it. A deity that revels in blood sacrifices and burnt human offerings. Does that sound like compassion or like the monstrous hunger of a demonic creature? The God of the Old Testament was very capable of stopping Jephthah, just like he stopped Abraham from killing his own son or how he killed Onan for spilling his seed outside his dead brother's wife. If he wanted to, God could have intervened. Okay, that's the extent of our examples from the Old Testament. I could list so many more, but we have to move on. The difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament is that in the Old Testament, God would personally visit his wrath upon you while you lived. With the New Testament, you have your life to live as you choose, but you must choose Jesus. If you don't, then when you die, you face the same vengeful, evil God monster of the Old Testament. So in essence, Jesus is just holding back the pit demon until you die. Then you're all his. Number four, Jesus talks of casting the wicked into eternal fire. In Matthew 25, 31 through 46, Jesus tells of a final judgment, saying the wicked will be cast into eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. This is a shift from the OT God monster who relishes doling out punishments in the present. Now, the monster lurks in wait, restrained just beyond death's door. Jesus isn't providing freedom, he's delaying judgment, giving you time to bend to his demands. The God monster of the Old Testament might not be striking now, but make no mistake, the threat of torment is only postponed, not forgotten. Number three, the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. In Luke 16, 19 through 31, Jesus tells of the rich man and Lazarus, with the rich man suffering in agony in this fire after death. Here we see the Old Testament God monster at work once again, enforcing brutal punishment for those who didn't toe the line in this life. The suffering isn't just physical, it's eternal, a constant reminder of what's at stake. And where's Jesus? He's presented as a single lifeline to protect us from this monster, the only way to avoid this fate. Yet the God monster isn't gone, it's merely biding its time, with the threat of damnation looming for anyone who dares to question or resist. Number two, Jesus said, I come not to bring peace, but a sword. In Matthew 10, 34 and 36, Jesus warns, I come not to bring peace, but a sword, and declares that even families will be divided over him. This isn't the language of a savior looking to unify. It's the language of a force intent on chaos and control. Divide and conquer, setting kin against kin and establishing division as a form of loyalty. The Old Testament of the God monster isn't gone. It's hiding behind a new message, a supposedly redemptive figure, tearing apart lives in a twisted show of loyalty, all now under the guise of love. Number one, and we're finally there, the pits of hell 
and eternal damnation. In his teachings, Jesus makes no secret of hell's torment. He describes it as a place where the fire never goes out, Mark 9.34, an eternal punishment for those who don't follow him. As I've mentioned, in the Old Testament, God punished in life. In the New Testament, he waits until the end, but the stakes are even higher. The God monster's punishment is now eternal, unending, and horrific, with Jesus presented as the only barrier. Accept him or burn forever. This is not salvation. It's extortion, an ultimatum crafted by the same pit demon trying to convince you it's the merciful creator of everything. So those are my top 10 reasons the God of Abraham is more like a pit demon than a merciful, loving God. What are your thoughts? Do you agree with me? Let me know in the comments below. I look forward to the ad hominem attacks from the Christians, so thank you for that too. Don't forget to subscribe so you'll get more of my live shows and my recorded content. Thank you very much and take care.